WrestleMania 20 holds a really special place in my heart. Because it's the first pay-per-view in WWE that I've ever watched. It was basically an introduction to me as a wrestling fan. Hey, we're the WWE, we understand you're a fan, and this is what we fucking got. And you know what? Granted, WrestleMania 20 was a decent show. It was not a great show, it was not really a good show, it was a decent show and a passable show. And for me, getting introduced as a wrestling fan back in 2004, I didn't mind it. I didn't mind it. Do I think it's one of the top ten WrestleManias? No. Doesn't have to be because of what happened during the show. A lot of what the WWE did during this show was pretty good. But a lot of it also seems kind of forgettable. So you open up with Cena versus The Big Show for the United States title. A really solid opener. Just think of the difference 11 years makes. Every arena now, Cena goes into and he's booed. But he, now he's at the Garden in WrestleMania 20, and all 20,000 people are cheering for him. What a, difference in ele- what a difference 11 years fucking makes. Seriously. But I think that the right guy went over. This was at a time when you were trying to start to establish a brand new top babyface in the company. And I think that John Cena being introduced, especially at WrestleMania 20, by uh, winning the United States title from a veteran like The Big Show. And I loved the feud between them, too. But again, this was ultimately about starting to plant the seeds of establishing a new star, and that's what it did. It was a really solid match. The right guy went over. A good way to start WrestleMania 20. Uh, You have the first of two four-way tag title matches. This one's for the world tag titles. You had uh, Booker T and RVD defending against La Resistance, the Dudley Boys, and you had, oh my god, Garrison Cade and Mark Jindrag. Jesus Christ. Garrison Cade was just so bland, and Mark Jindrag, he had the look of a top WWE guy, but he was also so bland, too. It was so ridiculous. Um, This match was just okay. Kind of there. It was a pretty decent space filler, especially considering that the next match, Christian versus Chris Jericho, was really damn good. So underrated as a WrestleMania match. And I'm shocked that it's not in a lot of a lot more people's like top fives or top tens. It was a really good WrestleMania match. The story was good, storytelling in the match was good, the aftermath was good, even Trish interfering at the end was really good. It was a really decent match, a really good match. Ultimately, the right guy went over. And ultimately, it's forgettable. I don't know why, though. So much of this match was really good. Especially considering a lot of the IWC likes Chris Jericho. So why is this being forgotten? I find it ridiculous. Then you get to the next match, which was Evolution versus Rock and Sock Connection. And... Ultimately, I didn't have any doubts that Evolution was going to go over. Especially, I didn't have any doubts that Orton was going to go over Mick Foley. I also didn't have any doubts that Mick Foley was going to be the one that, to do the job, considering that The Rock was in this match. Uh, but, you know, the match was alright. match wasn't that great, wasn't that bad. It was just in the middle. You know, nothing spectacular, nothing, nothing great, but also nothing bad. Didn't hurt the show at all. So we'll just move on to the next match, which was, I think it was the Playboy... Was it the Playboy Evening Gown match? Yes, that was it. Uh, Stacy and Tori Wilson versus... Uh, no, not Stacy. Oh, my God. Uh, Tori Wilson and Sable versus Stacy Keyboard and Miss Jackie. Um, drooling. Uh, passing out. Because, oh, the, the, Jesus Christ. <laughs> oh, my God. Stacy Keyboard. Tori Wilson, hell, even Sable, she was getting up there in age, but she looked she looked really good too. And Miss Jackie, I didn't really like her, but oh my god, Stacy Keebler, what the fuck happened to the WWE Divas Division? God damn it, give us more, damn it. Um, but match was what it was. It's was really, you know, I, I wasn't really focusing on the match. Uh, then you get to the 
Ah, uh, shit. The cruiserweight open. You had ten cruiserweights going at it. Again, and not a spectacular match, but it was a pretty decent match. You got some spots in there, which is good. Uh, I think that Rey Mysterio should have went over. I didn't think Chavo should have won the match. But I'm all right with whatever happened. Um, the one thing that I'm not all right about is the match that followed this. <sighs> Jesus Christ. Now, when you talk about the epitome of bad WrestleMania matches, on everyone's list, I guarantee you, in the top three, if not number one, is Brock Lesnar versus Goldberg with Stone Cold as the special guest ref. So much about this match was going to be really, really good, and now I look back at it, and I question why this match even happened. This match fucking sucked. You could tell that neither of them wanted to be there, neither of them cared. They just wanted a payday, and they just wanted to get the hell out of there because you knew Brock Lesnar was going to play football, you knew Goldberg was going to leave to pursue other things, and you knew Austin was in there for whatever the fuck reason. <laughs> but this match could have been something special, and it turned into something fucking terrible. Then you get to... Well, listen, if I skip a match, just just ignore... Just fill me in in the comments or something like that. Uh, I think there was a four, another four-way tag title match. Yes. Between... I think it was the world's greatest tag team. I know Too Cool was in there. I'm trying to remember who else. Uh, APA was in there. All right, whatever. I don't I forget about the fourth team, but match was solid. Nothing, nothing great. Another spot fill, another space filler. I mean, to get to the main event, uh, you know, you had the women's title match next, Molly Holly and Victoria. That was a fun match. The ending was hilarious with Molly Holly having to get her head shaved off. You know, the match actually wasn't that bad, but um, you know, it's kind of forgettable, kind of bland. Uh, and then you get to the three reasons why a lot of people bought this show, uh, myself included, even though I didn't really, I didn't actually buy it, my uncle taped it, but let me rephrase this. It was the three reasons why I remember this show. The first one is Angle versus Guerrero for the WWE title. Really damn good match, really damn good story, really damn good ending, and a really damn good time watching this. This makes me miss Eddie Guerrero so much because this match was really good. You know, and then you get to Undertaker versus Kane. You know, you look back a couple years ago when these guys had really good chemistry and then you look at this match and the chemistry was kind of off. But at the same time, the build-up to this was really good. Having the Undertaker not appear but having him play some mind games with Kane was really good thought the match went on a little bit too long. I think that The Undertaker should have just came out and uh, pretty much had Kane job. I would have been fine with that. I think the match kind of went too long. But I'm okay with it. Again, it was a good space filler between the two world title matches. And then you get to the main event. And... Unfortunately, I'm forced to not remember this match even though I want to remember this match, because of just how damn good it was. And it was Chris Benoit winning the World Heavyweight Championship by defeating Shawn Michaels and Triple H in this triple threat match. The build-up to this was really good. The storytelling in this was really good. The match was really good. The crowd in it was really good. You know, the fact that they had some blood in there too, made it a little violent, made it a little unique was really good. Having Benoit being portrayed as an underdog, you know, oh, who can beat these two guys? These two guys were the faces of the company from, you know, the late, mid to late 90s in the case of Shawn Michaels and then the late 90s, early 2000s in the case of Triple H. You know, how can Benoit stand a chance against these guys? And then you have him pull out a really big victory by finally getting his world championship that I thought that at the time he deserved. What a way to be introduced as a wrestling fan. To be taken on a journey like that 
And it didn't even last... It didn't even last a couple of months that the feud did. It lasted years from when Benoit was in WCW. I was taken on a journey. And that journey culminated with this big victory. And perhaps the most important memory of this pay-per-view was at the end when you had Benoit and Eddie Guerrero, two guys that traveled the roads together, two guys that slept in the same freaking beds because there were no other beds to sleep in. Guys busted for miles, going place by place, arena by arena. By arena. Just spectacular. It made me choke up when I first watched it. And going back and watching it again, I get choked up more. A really good match. In fact, a great match. It would be an all-time great match. But I'm forced to forget about it. Because of Chris Benoit. It's really sad that going back and watching this, you think, I was taken on a journey to follow this man. And you look back and you question why you were on this journey with him. This man doesn't deserve a journey. And because of what happened in 2007, I'm forced to forget about the pay-per-view that brought me into the wrestling community. That's how I feel about this show. It makes me sad going back and watching it again. A great moment in WWE that was taken away because of the, stupi the stupidity of fucking Chris Benoit.